Pray with me. Lord, we ask that you would still our hearts, open our hearts and our eyes to see you this day and incline our hearts to follow you in obedience. Through Jesus, amen. So have you ever gone out to go look for something? This thing that you think is there and it actually looks different than what you might expect. And because when you do eventually find it, you realize that it's not what you were expecting, that's why you couldn't see it to begin with. See, your mind was not ready to comprehend and you were narrow in your thinking of what it was supposed to look like. Uh, I'm not going to talk about how many times in my household where I have sent someone of my household to go look for something and they couldn't find it because it didn't look like what they were searching for. The packaging was somehow different. It was in a jar instead of a package or any such things like that. I don't keep track. And then there's Waldo, you know, with the, the little guy in his striped shirt. We know that what Waldo is wearing. So we look for Waldo in the midst of this crowd of people. We look carefully for him. But there's a little bit that's easy because we know, because someone has made this up for us, we know that Waldo is in there somewhere, right? Because someone has put him in there, that picture. But what about Jesus? Where is Jesus? How do we find him? Of course, we should also ask, how did the disciples find him after the resurrection? But of course, we know the answer to that already. They didn't. <laughs> Jesus found them. Consider our gospel story today in Luke 24. The raised Jesus sat at table fellowship with his followers. They should have known from their study of the prophets that Jesus' fate would not have been pretty, but you know what? They didn't know. They didn't even know when Jesus predicted his death and resurrection. See, the first century Jews did not anticipate a suffering Messiah. But Jesus knew. Jesus studied his own scriptures and understood what was coming. In their current understanding and uncertainty, God still had things to teach them. The veil would eventually be lifted. In this story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus with two followers, we have one of the most detailed accounts of the resurrected Jesus. Now, this is the kind of story that does not make the disciples look so great. I mean, not so bad, but not so great either. After all, think about what a perfect story would have included and compare that to what we have. Briefly, the perfect story is the disciples recognizing Jesus immediately, jumping up for joy, embracing him, congratulating themselves all along, knowing that Jesus was destined to come back to life. That would be the fictionalized, the idealized version of history. If you're going to make up a story about yourself, you usually make yourself look good. And this one, shows that the followers of Jesus, well, they were struggling to accept the resurrection of Jesus. Many stories show that. Instead, <clears throat> we get this real story of Cleopas and another person. And no one knows really who that other person is. Was it his wife, maybe? That could explain why there was no name offered. See, my husband and I engage in intense theological discussions, and we would have wanted to review all of the details of what had transpired in Jerusalem those several days. 
the description suggests a wide ranging conversation in which they rehashed all of the events. And actually there's a little bit of a, a vigorous fellowship going on. There's, there's some debate, some not argument. I don't want to go that far. Anyway, they, were le they had left Jerusalem to walk back to this now obscure village of Emmaus. Uh, that also has not been clearly identified uh, for these many years. People say maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly where it is. It was a village after all. But the detail does add a historical rootedness for the people at the time. So Jesus, so this, these two are having this intense discussion and Jesus sidled up to the pair. Now, Jesus, but with a form from, with, of a resurrected body that they could not recognize. Verses 16 and 17 say, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Notice the passive voice, were kept. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And then they stood still looking sad. Now, we shouldn't give them too hard of a time. It's not like Jesus had his social media account and his his profile picture available for all, to making sure that his face is recognizable to anyone and everyone. No photos. <laughs> I mean, even when we think about the Garden of Gethsemane, and we know that the guards and the priests relied on Judas's kiss to identify Jesus as the right person. Now, if these two had seen Jesus in person any time after his arrest, we know that Jesus' torture and his crucifixion had changed his appearance. But Luke, the one telling this story, uses grammar to indicate an important distinction. Their eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus as if God concealed this information from their understanding. Now, I think Peter's letter to the churches gets it right when he said in our passage today of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake. See, God is clearly the one who makes Jesus known. In the revelation of his identity before the resurrection, but even more so after the resurrection. But these two followers of Jesus who were concerned enough about Jesus' identity to have a vigorous fellowship, God still had some things to teach them. The veil had not yet been lifted. Now this is not the first time that Luke has developed this theme. We see it in the transfiguration where the three disciples did not understand Jesus's impending betrayal. And it says it, they were concerned that because that knowledge was concealed from them so that they may, might not perceive it. And they were too afraid to even ask Jesus about this saying. You can look that up in Luke 9, verse 45. And then later on in chapter 18, when Jesus tried to explain again what would happen to him in the future, we are told the disciples did not understand because the meaning was hidden from them. So we can say that at least some of the time, the reason people do not understand who Jesus is has an explanation in the hiddenness of God. See, God needs to reveal Jesus to his people because without that, even his closest followers 
are left in the dark, in the veil of misunderstanding. So what does Jesus do to bring about a clear revelation of his identity, short of showing his nail-pierced hands? See, Jesus didn't lecture them. Well, at not, not yet, at least. <laughs> Instead, they did the talking. And he asks them, well, tell me the story. What is this story that you're talking about? <clears throat> and they told the history of Jesus, which, of course, he already knew. See, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the peoples, and how are the chief priests and the rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and then crucified? But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of the company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Now, some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women had said. But him, they did not see. So those disciples, those followers, they did the talking. And in their explanation, they revealed that they could not see Jesus, with Jesus standing right in front of them. They did not know that their Messiah would experience persecution or that he would be raised from the dead. Now, it does look like Jesus gets a little frustrated. He calls them foolish and slow of heart. And Jesus challenged them to think more deeply. Verse 27, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted it to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And that's when the veil was beginning to be lifted. But those two followers needed one more action before they could see Jesus, before they could find him. That's in verse 30. When Jesus was at table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. Their inability to see Jesus was finally overturned by God's decisive action of revelation. God revealed himself at the breaking of the bread. God lifted the veil from their minds and their eyes so that they could set their hope fully on the grace that will be brought to them at the revelation of Jesus. That's from 1 Peter. As I mentioned earlier, the followers of Jesus may have struggled to accept the resurrection of Jesus, but once they saw the revealed Jesus. They were ready to die for the faith. This is the kind of grace that makes such profound changes in our hearts that we are willing and ready to go outside of our comfort zones. But the question is, where is Jesus in the everydayness of our lives? as in today. We know that God is somehow and somewhat hidden. So how will we perceive him? I have three options. We see Jesus revealed in the servanthood and tangible love of others. It is true that in the midst of sadness and devastation and tragedy, the heart of Jesus shines all the brighter in the sacrificial love shown by his people. We have many stories of that right now. We see love 
And we, but we know that love is derivative. It actually starts with God's love, God's heart. And when we serve one another in love, we know that it starts with God and flows out to his people. But people won't know that unless we name his name, Jesus, as part of our testimony. So that's one way. Where is Jesus today? How do we find Jesus today? Jesus, even today, is known in the breaking of the bread during Eucharist. See, we believe in the real presence of Christ who makes himself known during communion. It is a sacrament, an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. That is part of why it is so hard during this pandemic to watch and not physically participate in God's holy supper. We participate in a spiritual sense, but not in a physical sense. Jesus is known in the breaking of the bread. And one day we will once again participate with him in this sacrament. And thirdly, Jesus is a part of our everyday lives, whether we are aware of him or not. The physical part of Jesus, the physicality, the bodily part, is seated at the right hand of God, the Father ruling over all creation, but the spirit of Christ is ever present with us. We know that because it has been revealed to us. See, Jesus is not a flat and boring character from a storybook. Reflecting on Jesus on the cross, we see the totality of his character and his love. The more real Jesus is through our prayers, through meditation, through reflection, and putting ourselves in a place for God to show us this depth, well, then we will see Jesus. And it's not that our seeking becomes the sole important ingredient, but we do participate in the revealing by having this deep spiritual life. The walking down a road with Jesus is an apt image that comes from this story, this walk with Jesus toward Emmaus. The sitting at table with Jesus is an apt image of our communing with him in table fellowship. We are walking and we are eating with a beloved person. Do you see him? Amen.